Good morning, uh, everyone. Lars started saying this morning, expect the unexpected. And I was still sitting there thinking, oh, I'm after lunch. Well, I'm not. So <laughs> here I am, completely prepared, as always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, OK, you've heard the word risk coming by on quite a few uh, occasions now. And Bill has used it in a number of ways. And what I'm going to try is to give you a bit more solid ground of what risk is and what you need to know to be able to manage it. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to teach you the tricks of how to apply the methods, but what I want to sketch you is the field in which we operate and the methods and tools that are available to you that you may have heard of and to discuss what similarities and differences are. It all starts with what we're doing and why we're doing it. And um, you can say that the goal of our profession is to pass on the heritage that's been given in our care to the future generations, our children, our grandchildren. But not just, here's the stuff, good fun. No, it's passing it on with as much significance and value uh, that we can, but also with accessibility. We live in a time where we don't just keep things to keep them, put them in storage as time capsules and see in a hundred years what comes out. It's a wonderful example of incubating that you gave. That would be such a method, but then it's inaccessible. You can't use it. And currently we use in a society that wants to use its uh, heritage as well, but in a responsible way. So we can enjoy it and use it for our own purposes, but we don't want to impair it for our children and grandchildren. They have to be able to interpret and use it as well. The uh, way in which at the Cultural Heritage Agency we operate is the, the heritage management philosophy that was introduced by Robert Waller uh, in 2003, already earlier, he said, if, if you have heritage, whether it's a collection, a building or a site, there is three main tasks that we do with it. First of all, we develop heritage. We uh, make it accessible. We try to understand what it is, describe the value significance so uh, we can develop it. We use it. We all go and see the sites, visit the museums. We like the audience to interact with it. It's a form of use, but also studying your archives, reading books, all forms of using heritage. And the big business that most of us are in is preserving it. But as I said, it's not just the stuff that we're interested in. The stuff is just a container. We care about the contents, and we care about the contents in terms of the significance and the meaning that it has for us and the value that we attribute to it. So we're not really managing heritage as material, as stuff. We're managing values. And if you look at the perspective from, from values, then developing your collection is to try increase the value by studying the the history of your objects, the stories of your objects, enriching the objects with significance, with their stories, you actually increase the value. When we use our collections, we operate the value, and we use the value of our collections to generate income, if you look at it from a business perspective. And we need income because we need to preserve, maintain our value, or minimize the losses. So you can understand that from a perspective as this, a philosophy of this, of managing heritage, managing values, the first thing that we need is methods to make that value explicit. And that is what Tessa will talk about tomorrow, uh, about the defenseless value of, of objects. Um, there's an Australian method. Uh, significance that's been around for a while, and Tessa will talk about uh, our own value assessment methodology that we have built on significance, but with a number of improvements, we think. If we go back to this whole um, system of 
heritage management, there are threats, there are hazards that may cause a loss of value. And when we talk about the possibility or the probability, the likelihood of a loss of value, then we're talking about risk. A tourist is a hazard. A tourist doesn't necessarily have to be a risk. A tourist becomes a risk when the heritage, the value that we care for, is actually exposed to this tourist and something may happen which causes a loss of value. If he makes a 50 atom deep scratch in a piece of plexiglass, we may not consider that as a loss of value and then the risk becomes zero. If we do think it's a loss, we need to express it. Our perception needs to be um, translated into a loss of value to which we can attribute a possibility of this loss and then we can uh, estimate the magnitude of our risk. Okay, we come back to that. Risk assessment, risk management has a bit of a past already. We're not at the early days anymore and I think it's fair to say that Stefan Mikelski at the Canadian Conservation Institute was one of the the grounding fathers of some of the concepts that we use in risk management. In 1992, he came up with this uh, systematic approach to conservation and collections care in museum collections. Both he and I come from the museum and the movable heritage rather than built, but we've learned through the years that the methodologies that we have developed go for all sorts of heritage. So if I have collections, examples, please forgive me, that's what I feel most comfortable with, but translate it to your own situation and it will work. Um, Stefan came from a, a preventive conservation background, looking at light and climate and all sorts of agents of deterioration, which he thought, they're not loose things, they're connected and there needs to be a framework that puts them all together. So he is the, the the founding father of the framework for preventive conservation, which then served as um, the, the basis for Robert Waller, who developed this whole risk management methodology, but used the framework with the 10 agents of deterioration. I actually added the 10th um, for his first uh, papers on risk assessment for preventive conservation. And it's very much this link with preventive conservation. And then in, at the end of the last millennium, uh, Jonathan Ashley Smith in the UK came up with his book, Risk Assessment for Object Conservation, which is a more philosophical description of how to deal with risk, but does not provide you with a method. The only one that has a method was Robert Waller, and he actually uh, did a PhD at your own Gutenberg University and published his methodology, CPREM, the Cultural Property Risk Analysis Model, in 2003. And this is where all these guys, myself, uh, Luis Pedrozoli, who will talk later today, we basically worked on with what Robert Waller gave us. Okay, we were talking about threats and hazards and these 10 agents of deterioration. And I think it's helpful to just show them to you and run quickly past them. These are, um, and Elizabeth already opened by saying, there's your natural causes, there's human-made causes, all sorts of things happening in the big world. Um, that then channel through people, through all sorts of agents and actually interact with your heritage. And whether it's an earthquake or a tourist uh, who is quite clumsy and walks into a uh, collection of vases, it's actually the physical forces that we call as the agent. So the agent physical forces has a number of causes from earthquakes to tourists to wear and tear but it will have an effect eventually on your objects by uh, causing abrasion, cracking, breaking, collapsing, whatever. 
And the same with water. It's also one of those agents where various causes, from floods to heavy rains to bursting pipes, come. They're all water-related, and it's the water that then causes your uh, watercolor to run or not. There's fire, there's criminals and vandals, or thieves and vandals, and the, um, there the specialty is that it's malicious intent, so it's people that actually want to cause damage. There's pests, they cause similar damage as thieves and vandals, but they don't do it on intent, it's just their way of living. Although you could say that from thieves as well, of course. Um, light, UV, infrared, radiation, contaminants, um, the climate risks, incorrect temperature, incorrect relative humidity, and dissociation. And dissociation is one that uh, Robert Waller added to the list of nine agents that Stefan Mikalski created. Because the first nine, they're all material focused. Dissociation is the only one that has to do with the immaterial part of your heritage. It's a disconnection of the object and all the knowledge and information that we have about it. So it could be a label that falls off, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you don't know where your object came from, what it is. Uh, but it can also be someone who retires, disappears with all the knowledge, didn't write it down, is actually a big loss of the complete uh, value package of your object or your collection. So these agents play a role in our systems. And then they cause a threat. They cause their hazards. They come through these agents and they cause a threat. It becomes a risk when there's an exposure and there is a possibility of loss of value. And as, as Elizabeth already sketched this morning, that we're not the inventors of risk. It came from the nuclear industry, all other sorts of industry. But we have made it, the methodology, the approach is fit to work for preservation. But there's always an interaction with what we do with collections and heritage risk management with for example, the people that use our heritage, that come to visit, also our own staff in the uh, organization. So there's health and safety risks. And sometimes they touch each other. If you have radioactive um, objects, you deal with both. There's financial risks in your organization, and there's the reputational risks. And often we think, oh, you know, if you steal one object, there's only a little bit of our collection lost. Bah, the loss of value is not so big. But the reputational risk can be so huge that we don't want to know this. And this is an overruling risk from what would be a small risk if you look at it purely from your collection point of view. So we deal with those as well. But these all are in a whole organization in a business that has its own business risks, that lives in a bigger world where there's economic risks. And we've done wonderful risk assessments, knew how to deal with your collection and how to pro protect it properly. And then the crisis hit, so all our solutions were impossible. Or politics changed, complete museum shut down. Well, there you are with your lovely solutions of filters on your windows nothing to filter, to put your filters on anymore. Um, legal risks, you name it. It's, it's all one big risk world. And no wonder that uh, there are standards for risk management. It started with the Australian-New Zealand standard for risk management. That is a procedural standard. It describes the process uh, and the steps that you go through, which is a lovely thing. And we've used that ever since uh, we found it. Later, the International Standard Organization, ISO, basically built its international standard very much on the methodology uh, provided by the Australians. And as you see, the similarity is reflected in the cover as well. Um, okay, so what does this standard describe? It describes the whole process of risk management, which contains a number of steps. And if you want to deal with the unexpected, you have to first try to assess what could I actually expect to go wrong, to cause damage, to cause this loss of value? So you have to start with identifying all the things that can go wrong. 
And then you want to analyze them. You want to somehow express how big they are so that you compare them and that you can make an evaluation and a ranking of how to set your priorities. And that whole block together is the risk assessment. And you need the risk assessment to not to make decisions, but to help you make the arguments to support your decision explicit. That's what risk management or risk assessment is about. This risk assessment plays, of course, in a bigger context. And we need to establish that context first. What is it that we are assessing? What is the scope? Am I looking at my collection, a collection in a building? Do I care about the building? Forget about the collection. Is it this whole city? What is it that we're looking at? But also, why, if we talk about losing value, what is the value in the first place? And this is where Louise and the value pie will also give some help. And in the end, of course, what you want to do is treat your risks, not treat your heritage, but treat the risk, reduce your risk, make them smaller to a level where you find them acceptable. All of that happens in an environment where there's people at work, which means that you have to communicate and consult, and you constantly monitor and review. It's a process where you do two steps forward, one step back, reflect, and go forward again. So it's very iterative. And our, our own uh, experience is that once we've gone through the whole thing, we feel now we're ready to actually do it properly and we begin all over again. But I think that's, that's the whole key of it. It becomes a way of life rather than just an exercise that you do once. And that's the, I think for us, the most valuable part of the whole risk assessment approach. It's about working with people, bringing knowledge and experience together, sharing it for that same shared goal of passing on your heritage with value and accessibility. And the soft side of it, understanding our heritage, what we're dealing with, why we find it important, why we want to pass it on, is much more important than a lot of numbers that come out of graphs that come out. That's, that's just sort of a, a way to together realize what it is that you're doing. Okay, um, identifying and goes together with risk scenarios, and I'll quickly show you a few examples. Um, usually you think from a source, a tourist, causes scratches on my plexiglass. Or you can go the other way around. I have scratches on my plexiglass. Who would cause that? Not just the tourist, it could also be uh, the cleaner coming with the nice scratchy sponge. Um, so there's also a path, a mechanism. Somehow the source has to come to the object to have an effect that also gives me the possibilities to build in barriers and protection. So these three key elements give you a risk scenario. A tourist comes in by accident, bumps into my plexiglass face-mounted photograph and makes a scratch. There we have a scenario. Then we can assess it and say, how big is the possibility that this will happen? What is the material effect? And how do we perceive that and turn that into a loss of value? And then we can quantify the risk. So risk is a chance of loss of value. And it always deals with a probability and an impact, a likelihood and a consequence. Or how soon, how often does something happen that may cause a change? And how bad is that change? And then you can say, OK, uh, it's rare or frequent or even constant. An earthquake, tourists bumping in, or light that shines constantly. And that causes an effect, which can be mild, significant, big. You can also put numbers to that if you want categories or even attribute weighted scales and make them proper numbers. Um, or you can do it very complicated and lose counting. But this is sort of what the basis of risk assessment and trying to give a magnitude to risks is all about. And then this, the simplest tool that we have to express and, and order the risks is a risk matrix. And you probably have seen this 
uh, already before. There's all sorts of matrices. If you go and try to find the perfect fitting tights or ski pants, you have something with length and something with width, and then you can find your size. Always works for me. Um, but Robert Waller, in his C prem methodology, okay, I need a more rigid approach. So I look at uh, at all my agents of deterioration that are listed here, and then there's various types because there's your catastrophes and your significant or your uh, more frequent and your processes. And then I look at my collection in this case, and, and I split it up in, in all my collection units, and then you get this wonderful graph that shows you the, the risk of the world that you live in. And obviously, I always call this the forest graph. The highest trees in the forest are the ones that you want to chop down, and then your risk level comes down, right? And your priority is to start with the highest trees. So, Stefan Mikelski, with a lot of help from Louise, they looked at it and said, yeah, this is not user-friendly enough. We must come up with a, a simpler way. And instead of these, these, uh, this, this rather complex uh, calculation that you have to do to come up with the forest graph, we do it a bit simpler. We do an A, B, C score. And those of you that uh, will do our workshop on Wednesday will learn more about the A, B, C scales. But this is basically how soon uh, or how fast, that's uh, the red score, and then what does it do with any object that is affected, there you give a yellow score, and then how many objects or how much of my value, pi, wait for Louise, uh, is affected, a large bit or a small bit, that's your blue score, and that gives you sort of the loss of your whole collection that we expect to happen in a certain time span. So. We thought this will be a bit easier, and we've taught this with the ECROM CCI ICN uh, courses for a number of years, and we liked it, absolutely. It was much easier than Rob's uh, methodology, but it was also rougher, and Rob felt that we were a bit too, too rough, but okay. And then in Holland we thought, well, we can make it still more user-friendly by using uh, uh, the computer and come up with a, a, a software system that will help you do the calculations for you and lead you through this process, just like the tax form. I have a lovely hate-love relationship with the tax uh, department, so I thought let's at least use something useful from them. And what we added was the scenario schemes, which help you identify the risk by already plotting sort of the, the main lines from the various sources, the pathways, the barriers in between to the objects and the effects that it can have. I realize this is very much collection oriented. You need a bit of imagination to translate this for buildings or sites, but it is possible. Anyway, this, this was the solution for the whole world, of course. Well, of course it wasn't because only a year later we already decided it's still too much work. The world has changed, as Lars said already this morning. We live in a fast, rapidly changing world. And when Rob developed his methodology, which came with this beautiful graph, we thought that's it. We still had time, we had staff to do the work and to look at all these risks and calculate them one by one. Today, we don't have money anymore, we don't have the time, we don't have the staff. One single person in a small museum has to make a decision, cannot sit behind his desk and walk through the museum for a year to figure out which is my biggest risk, where am I going to start? No, we need a different approach. And if this is the forest where we can't see the big trees because we're on the ground, we need an approach. We have to throw this whole forest upside down and fly over it and figure out a way to spot the tallest trees and let's zoom in on those first and if we feel uncomfortable we take a few more trees but we want to be efficient and only analyze those risks where we feel we need to have grip and they are the ones that will drive our decision and i suppose with the value assessment methodology which very much uh, follows the lines of the risk assessment methodology we have the same 
as, as Bill gave this example of if you start with, okay, these are my criteria, and now I'm going to choose my car, you actually come out with a Skoda. That's, that's the general rule because it's cheap, it has quality for its price, efficiency, blah, blah, blah. But if I ask you what car do you want, you want either a BMW or probably a Volvo, which I saw yesterday. Volvo is made not in Sweden, but by Sweden. I thought this is a wonderful commercial. I saw the posters everywhere. But you want a Volvo. Okay, let's start with you want a Volvo. So why do you want a Volvo? And then you can use the criteria to work down because this, this, this and this. And then there may be a few criteria that are not on our usual uh, criteria shopping list. But it helps you to make explicit why you want a Volvo. Maybe on the way you come to the conclusion that maybe a Volvo is actually not what I want, even though I thought I want it. But given that this criterion is more important for me, I actually want a Saab, because it has to be Swedish. Okay. Um, but it, it's, so you have to use these methods and the tools that we offer you, either working from the bottom up and zooming out, or you think, no, 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 I start at the end of the book and then I zoom in. That's more efficient in my case. And for risk management, I ran into the problem with, with Anna Bulo, who will do the workshop with me uh, on Wednesday. She works at the British Museum. And she says, oh shit, I have six million objects. They don't want to do a risk assessment with me because it's too much work. And yeah, I can figure that out. <laughs> okay, we're going to do something completely new. We developed the Quisk scan, the Quisk, I can't even say it, the quick risk scan, the Quisk scan. And the British Museum hadn't heard anything about the methodology yet, but the word, they love the word. So yes, we'll do a quisk scan. Okay, what's the quisk scan? Okay, <laughs> we, we quickly go, do I have light here? Probably somewhere. Oh, shit. <laughs> Wrong button. Okay, what, what we do is we, we, we split up the collection that we have in, in bite-sized units. That's usually material classes or whatever units you have in your catalog. And then we do very roughly, okay, what's, what's the high value ones here? And what's the medium value ones and the low value ones? And then we look at the vulnerability for the 10 agents of deterioration. And where high value meets high vulnerability, we think, okay, this is a tall tree. This is where we have to do an analysis. We don't have a risk yet. We just have identified the potential risks because high value, might give a high loss of value because it is highly vulnerable. So this is a tall tree. And this is where we then only zoom in on the red cells. And if we have the feeling this gives us enough uh, to work with, let's deal with those risks first. Let's analyze them. So we have our units and this works for a collection example, but it works for other types of heritage as well. We do a very rough value assessment we start with, is it high, medium, low value? And then we ask why. Give me the arguments. Use the methodology, use the criteria. But we go from back to, for to front. Same with the vulnerability. Are they vulnerable? Why? What is vulnerable? Give me an example. And then we get the red cells, where there's vulnerable value or a potential risk. And then we ask ourselves for these red cells, is there an exposure? Is it going to cause a loss of value? If so, what's the probability? And then we get a grip on the magnitude of our risk. So we've just done this at the Open Air Museum in, in our country, where, for example, you can see that fire, I give you this example because I know it always works, fire is always the biggest risk in any institution. But in this case, the loss of a single object, okay, but the reputational risk is so big because this is a, a, a high, uh, high visibility uh, exhibition, so they can't afford any loss of value. So here it's very simple to say we need uh, a sprinkler because we can't afford any loss to fire and we actually have a lot of vulnerability to uh, fire these are all uh, high-profile objects as well, so they all score in the highest category. And there are real threats both inside. There's a lot of uh, technology inside the building, and it's a forest area where 
we are known to have forest fires. So that was easy, but we can make it visible with a tool that management understands and uh, we have the arguments to support our recommendations. And in the end, that's what risk management and risk assessment are all about. It's about coming up with these arguments, about having good reasons for making decisions and to be able to convince the decision makers, because usually it's not us that make the decisions, but if we have the right arguments, we can influence the ones that do. So we have to communicate within the organization, and I think that is the, the most uh, valuable aspect of the whole exercise for me. With the experts, um, but also with your stakeholders, they're very important because they also determine the value that you have, because it's also valuable for them. Decision makers, you have to communicate in such a way that they quickly grab the message and that's what we hope that the tools and the methods that we develop actually help by. And your public, which is one of the stakeholders. But and I think that uh, brings me to the conclusion. So there are quite a number of, of methods and tools, but they all go back to the same principles of identify, analyze and evaluate your risks so that you have arguments for risk reduction. From all these methods and tools, you need to select the ones that are good enough for you, not the best. You don't want the best, that's a waste of time, but you want the best for the job. Not too much, but enough because you want to have strong enough arguments to convince others. And as we all know, times have changed. The world has become smaller. Time moves faster. We live in a global world where a lot has changed. And we need to find a compromise between the effort that we put in and the reliability of the answers that we come out. Because in the end, what you put in is what you get out. Garbage in is garbage out. But you don't want to spend all your effort on it. So it needs to be good enough. And from our experience now is that we rather zoom in and come in from the top, then zoom out and start at the bottom, which of course is always the best, but it's so much work that we think we flip the whole world upside down that makes it easier for us and for all those that have little time and, and money. So whatever method you are presented with, always ask yourself, should I work backwards? Might that be easier? It's a bit cheating. If you read a novel and you read the end, do they find each other in the end? Yes, okay. Then you don't need to read the rest of the novel anymore, which, which, which takes away a lot of fun from you, but it is effective. And the question is, what's best in your situation? The fun bit or just the effective bit? Okay, that's it for me. Thank you.